Hello again, and welcome back to An Aesthetic Education. In this episode, we find ourselves in the middle of things, the middle of the medieval period, the middle of the Middle Ages, if you will. This is the point where we reach the height of our journey, a point in which experiences have led to a bursting forth of new ideas, and this new excitement, this great energy, is pushing forward a youthful reinvigoration that permeates the civilized world. In his speech on the Discourses of Art given to the Royal Academy in 1769, Sir Joshua Reynolds, the founder and first president of that special institution, discussed how the education of a young artist could be divided into three stages. The first stage is in the rudiments of one's earliest years as one tries to learn the grammar of art. This is the period in which the basic structures, methodologies, and general preparation become a part of the artist's foundations. The second stage is when art itself becomes the master of the student, and they go about their learning not from a specific individual, but from the widest range of masterful creations. This widening of scope and sequence is done in an attempt to learn and understand everything that has come before them. The final stage, and the one that interests us the most, is without a doubt the most difficult. About this stage, Reynolds says the following. The third and last period emancipates the student from subjugation to any authority, but what he shall himself judge to be supported by reason. Confiding now in his own judgment, he will consider and separate those different principles to which different modes of beauty owe their original. He is from this time to regard himself as holding the same rank with those masters whom he before obeyed as teachers, and as exercising a sort of sovereignty over those rules which have hitherto restrained him. Comparing now no longer the performances of art with each other, but examining the art itself by the standard of nature, he corrects what is erroneous, supplies what is scanty, and adds by his own observation what the industry of his predecessors may have yet left wanting to perfection. Having well established this judgment and stored his memory, he may now, without fear, try the power of his imagination. These three stages of an artist's career describe the degrees in which an artist journeys on a path to creative and aesthetic beauty. This journey of learning becomes a visual one that we can trace within every creation of art that they make throughout their lives. They begin with the basics, then they try to capture the greatness that has already been discovered through understanding and mimicry of the great works. And only once they have become masters of their art in their own right are they able to take on and grapple with the rules of art and use their own imaginative creative force. It is in this third stage of the artist's journey that we pick up our exhibition of outstanding works from the Middle Ages and Renaissance. In our last episode, we left off with the lessons from Lorenzetti's Good and Bad Government, those wonderful frescoes which serve as powerful reminders of the two paths available to mankind, one of peace and prosperity, the other of subjugation and suffering. Today, we choose not to dwell on the difficult subject of governance, but instead we'll take a closer look at the works of art that inspire within us a youthful vigor, that provide a moment where we can ocularly peruse the world, and instead of seeing only limitations, we can begin to see the possibilities. These works are the ones that the artists create at their peak, where they have mastered the conventions of art but still contain the boldness, the youthful spirit and desire to push boundaries and create something new, to find its place within the wider world of aesthetic beauty. So now let's continue our sojourn through our curated exhibition by exploring how at the height of its creative output, the artists of the Middle Ages were able to master the art of the ancient world before pushing the creative boundaries to new heights and gifting to humanity the greatest spark of inspiration and possibilities. In the halls of the Musée Condé, located in the Chateau de Chantilly, lies an exceptional piece of medieval illumination. The Book of Hours of the Duc de Berry is one of those rare pieces that contains such a wide expanse of beauty that every page is a feast 
for those with any ounce of appreciation. Like all books of ours to be created in the Middle Ages, this one was initially created according to the desire and interests of its patron, John Duke de Berry, the brother of King Charles V of France. The manuscript contains 206 leaves of the finest quality parchment, where it houses 66 large miniatures and 65 small ones. A book of hours was created to contain all the prayers, psalms, and other texts that its owner held closest to their heart and soul, thereby allowing them to not only show their religious devotion, but through the beautifully created illuminations also show off their wealth and insight. With so many pages to choose from, one could spend years enjoying all that this particular book of hours has to offer. But for our purpose today, let's take a look at one particular page, the page of September, and the insight that it gives us to a world at the start of the 15th century. The Book of Hours, first and foremost, is a book of prayer. The name comes from the devotions for the seven canonical hours arranged to be read by the laity throughout the course of the year. Hence, at the start of the book, there is a calendar of the months, which is intended to cement one's mind and spirit in the necessary place at any given point of the year. Let's now turn our attention to the page of September. The illumination for September is one of the Duke de Berry's castles in the town of Samur, near the Loire River. The image of the great pickers working the field around the castle shows us the typical peaceful existence of the agricultural world at this time. In contrast to the rampaging nature of the political climate of the time period, this was after all created during the Hundred Years War, we are given an image of the agricultural idyll, where the ordinary ruled, hard work was a given, and peace and prosperity were the calls of the day. One can perhaps imagine and hear the sounds of the peasants in the field, or the wind whispering through the vines. It is an illumination of innocence, a nostalgic and idealistic look at what life was like at the start of that century. Where does this picture of innocence come from? This illumination seemingly contains a certain level of youthful innocence as to what the world is. Or perhaps it is in reality a return to that youthful innocence that comes with old age. To somewhat answer this question, we must find out a little bit more about who actually created this particular illumination. Like many manuscripts of this type, there were multiple artists who used their creativity to bring this book to life. This particular illumination is attributed to the Dutch miniature painters, the Limburg brothers, Paul and his brothers, John and Herman. The three brothers were young artists noted for their work with miniatures and had worked with Philip, Duke of Burgundy, and the elder brother of John, Duke de Berry. It was only after the Duke of Burgundy passed that they began to work with the Duke de Berry on his own Book of Hours. Those commissions led to the creation of the various calendar illuminations, including September. The range of work that the brothers created for the Duke was well rewarded and cemented their position as highly desirable artists. In the year 1416, all three brothers died before they reached the age of 30, possibly due to the plague, although obviously we will never know the exact cause of death. Later in that same year, their patron would also die, although he had managed to reach the much older and certainly grander age for the time period of 75 years old. The Book of Hours was left unfinished, and it was only many years later when it was compiled with some additions that brought it close to the form that we see today. The Limburg brothers, working for a patron like the Duke, would have felt the need to pay homage to his spirit and generosity. Yet this illumination of the idyll of the great pickers in September does hint at the artist's own almost dreamlike perception of the scene. The great pickers, some of whom are in slightly humorous positions, give scale to the grandeur surrounding them, and while they might be small, are certainly the stars of the piece. It takes a familiarity, and perhaps a bit of youthful exuberance, to capture people and moments, not as they want to appear, but as they actually are. Either way, the work of the Lindbergh brothers shows that at the start of this century, the tide was shifting. Young artists were coming to the foreground, and their enthusiasm, their mastery, and their knowledge would soon become the driving force for aesthetic expression over the course of the next 100 years. From France, we now make our way to the heart of the Renaissance, to Florence. 
where we find ourselves standing before what might be considered one of the greatest works in the history of art. La Primavera by Sandro Botticelli is one of those pieces that has been written and discussed in enormous detail for centuries. It is a painting that many of us are familiar with, but not one that we can ever truly understand what it is actually about. The world Botticelli brings us into is one of the old pagan myths and gods. There, the supposed Venus stands before us in the middle of a grove, surrounded by blossoming trees and flowers. What is believed to be Cupid is above her, blindfolded, with the three graces standing to the left. It is an image that screams out about the burgeoning rebirth and fertility of the world as spring comes into being. This is an image of creation at its purest, where youth and beauty combine to bring a new essence and life into the world. The earthly carnal lust of Zephyrus, the figure to the right, is ignored by the graces. The west wind of spring that Zephyrus calls forth is there to bring the spark of renewal to this grove, but it is not really even noticed by the other inhabitants. Instead, at the center of everything stands Venus, in all her beauty, charm, and quiet contemplation. Yet as we look at her and study her, we can't help but be drawn to the sense of mystery that surrounds her presence. It's as if she were awaiting someone or something. But her beauty appears to us to be just out of reach. We can see her, we can appreciate her, but we cannot know her. There is perhaps a desire for the untouchable, the unfulfilled. As Botticelli's muse and model for Venus was Simonetta Vespucci, who was a young woman that inspired the greatest of creative passions in many of the men of Florence. In his book entitled Rendezvous in Venice, Philippe Bossant, the renowned novelist and musicologist, tells the story of a young man named Pierre, who's trying to understand the lessons that his uncle Charles taught him about art, love, and beauty. As Pierre reminisces over his uncle and his mysterious life, he recalls the particular words that he told him about the power of art, youth, and how it was all encapsulated in the lives of those who lived in Florence at the height of the Renaissance. Do you know, Pierre, that if you look at the portrait of Simonetta in Chantilly, painted by Piero de Cosimo, you can hear her speak. Look at the mouth. Have a good look at her lips, Pierre. They are so perfectly drawn, with such marvelous precision that you know the sound of her voice. I can testify that although she was from Genoa, she pronounced Italian with a delicious linguistic peculiarity one hears here in Venice. It is written on her mouth. Can you see? You can hear how she recites the short love poems written for her by Lorenzo de' Medici. Exactly how she used to pronounce them. It's the relationship between the lower lip and the upper. Can you see? It happened, I think, on April the 26th. Yes, of course, the 26th since. Did you know, Pierre, that that date, the 26th of April, seems to be marked by fate in Florence? On April 26, Simonetta died. Giuliano de' Medici died two years later to the very day, on April 26th, 1478, by the knife of Francesco de Pazzi in the chancel of Santa Maria de Fiori, stabbed so many times and so furiously that his murderer severely wounded himself as he relentlessly struck at the body of the man he had already killed ten times over. Do you realize, Pierre, what Florence was like that year? Botticelli was 25. Girlandau was 20, Filippino Lippi was 19, Leonardo da Vinci 18, and their master Lorenzo de' Medici was 20 as well. What youth! Lorenzo discussed philosophy with Marsilio Ficino and composed sonnets for the beautiful Lucrezia Donati, who was then, how old was she? 22 or 23. The world was very young, Pierre. Rather, I think that in Florence it had begun to get younger. There are moments in history when everyone is young, and others which are only populated by old people, and when events begin to stutter and ramble. 
That year in Florence, a young woman arrived amid the youth of that world, and the whole of Florence fell in love with her. Everybody, Lorenzo, his brother Giuliano, the whole court, the poor people in the streets, the shopkeepers, the old people, the musicians, the painters, the monks in their monasteries, everybody. She was 16, and the world was doing everything it could to be like her. Don't you find that astonishing, Pierre? A 16-year-old girl who, without doing anything other than being who she is, beautiful, amiable, sweet, yes, that absolutely gracious, clever, shapes a city, orders people's lives, leaves the thought of painters and poets simply by who she is. And you see, Pierre, what is most surprising is not her at all. It is what was born from all that. A true masterpiece. I speak of those which will never die, which are forever a small treasure men have given to the world. A true masterpiece is a work which offers in its most beautiful form the most faithful image of the epoch of its birth. There are no exceptions. The epochs, Pierre, which don't find those means to transmit the strong and beautiful things they have, or which transmit them through ugliness or derision, are those which later, with the passing of time, are said not to be worth remembering or discussing. That too is without exception. You're wondering, my little Pierre, what is the link between what I'm saying and the gentle Simonetta Vespucci? I shall tell you. Rather not I, but Botticelli. If I tell you that at the time when Simonetta turned up in Florence, the world was getting younger, it's not a figure of speech. I should have said more precisely that it was flourishing again. Do you understand the Primavera? We have never known exactly what that painting represents. Who is that woman? What are the three graces doing there? We know nothing about it. We don't know what that fat, chubby cheeked Zephyr is doing, blowing and stretching his arms towards a nymph who seems to be chewing parsley. And what about Mercury, who seems to be busy gathering apples? We have no idea. But that is not important, since the true subject of a painting is not what it tells, but what it shows. What the Primavera shows is simply springtime in Florence, and as it is perfectly beautiful, it is the image of that world's youth. But look carefully, Pierre. Consider all of the paintings produced by Botticelli in his lifetime, all the women who appeared under his brush, Venus emerging from her shell naked and beautiful, the Virgin with the pomegranate, the Virtues, Jethro's young daughters, all resemble each other. They look like sisters. Do you know why? Because they are all a dream of Simonetta. He only ever painted her, or his memory of her. Were you aware, Pierre, that 40 years after her death, she was 23 when she died, Botticelli asked to be buried at her feet, in the Ogni Santi Chapel. He is still there. 23-year-old, Giuliano de' Medici loved her too, for six years without once touching her. When she arrived in Genoa, she was 16. Her cousin, Amerigo Vespucci was going to give his name to a whole continent that nobody had heard of yet. A year after Simonetta's death, Giuliano competed in a big tournament, one of those celebrations of men and horses adored throughout Italy, where all the people in town watched in the square, at windows, on balconies, on rooftops. You've never been to Siena, Pierre. What a shame. The celebration of the Palio is perhaps the most vibrantly alive of those customs that remain today from the Renaissance. We have museums, we have preserved palaces and carved galleries that we love. We have paintings which are for you and me the most precious things in the world, but the living Quattrocento, full of movement, shouting its pleasure, its horses prancing, is in Siena on the day of the Palio. You can still go to see it. On that day, on his horse, Caparisoned in velvet and gold, Giuliano de' Medici brandished a banner on which had been written in French, La Sans Pareil, Lady Without Equal, and on which Simonetta's face had been painted by Botticelli. A simple flag, 
for a sporting contest painted by Botticelli. Can you imagine that? All of Florence's working population was there too, like today at the Palio, and it saw itself mirrored proudly in the sweetest woman and the handsomest man. For that too needs to be said. When a people can no longer admire itself, it is lost. Once again, there are no exceptions. You see, Pierre, man can be measured by his capacity for beauty. That is why I told you I don't like derision. A man who forces himself to laugh, who vents his malice under cover of what one mistakenly calls humor, is a man who is not happy at heart. The same must be said for a people. When people can only express themselves through derision, that's because they are in pain and can't say anything more, can't paint or write or play without groaning like a deep rheumatism in an invalid. Talking of Simonetta's portrait in Chantilly, don't ask how long she needed to have her hair done, let alone give a thought for the coils of her blonde locks, and forget the curl that undulates around her neck, which one always imagines as a necklace or a dainty tame snake. Forget her small breasts, which are so ravishing but so chaste that one cannot imagine thinking to caress them. And rightly, for the painter tells us through the ravishing modesty of his painting that Giuliano never did that. Forget all that. Look at her eye. She doesn't look straight ahead, but slightly higher. It is the only profile I know which has such a look. What do we all do? You, me, stupidly? We look straight ahead. Simonetta doesn't look straight ahead, but slightly higher. As if the truth of things and the beauty of the world were there, just a tiny bit higher than where we think they are. There are paintings where beautiful saints raise their eyes to the sky. I must trust them. There are also sweet Flemish Madonnas who lower them with a charming timidity that touches my heart. But I feel like saying one word to them so that they will hear me and I will be able to meet their eyes. Simonetta overwhelms me, and even more for one doesn't know what she is looking at, far, far away and beyond the frame. Youth. That unbridled spirit of determination and creativity. A word that pushes forward a vision of age that we all seek to capture or recapture. The spirit of youth has very little to do with one's actual age, but rather has everything to do with one's beliefs. Of course, in its purest form, youth is the combination of an idealized spirit that lacks inhibition, sees possibilities, and is brave enough to take risks and do things in the right way. The possibility to create, the possibility to understand, and the possibility to leave one's mark in a positive way on the world. What's clear from the words of Reynolds and Bassant is that there comes a time when this spirit is overflowing and the world around it is molded to a new will. The artists of the Renaissance followed the path of learning as outlined by Reynolds. They mastered the art of the ancients before forging a new path, one built on their own creativity and imagination. That final stage, the stage where the artist reaches their summit of creativity, is the moment that Bossant captures in his description of Florence and the wonderful cast of characters that inspired each other to new heights. The truth is that too often, people misconstrue the spirit of youth with subversion, derision, and revolution, none of which captures what it can actually achieve. The power that comes from seeing the possibilities of life is, to put it simply, the ability to experience life's beauty in those moments that they are most pronounced. Then, and only then, can one add one's own brushstroke to the canvas, using the full force and vigor of one's imagination. It is important that in our time, we are aware of the process 
that took previous generations to the highest of heights. If we can understand their journey and their achievements, then we too can aim to be that same spark of inspiration, that comet in the night sky that flashes our brilliance and shows the hope of what is still to come. Until next time, this has been Altalena. Goodbye.